First Corinthians chapter 14. You could have guessed that. First Corinthians chapter 14. Are you there already? Almost. And then I'll read one verse just to show you. You know, normally I'll give you three verses to show you that I will take three hours to explain each of them. Uh, but First Corinthians 14, 3. I have repented. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Toasting that laugh is not the kind of laughter I was talking to them about. First Corinthians 14 and then verse 3. And the Bible says, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exaltation, and comfort to men. So there are three things involved in New Testament prophecy. The first one is exaltation, the second one is edification, and then the third one is comfort. Today, for a few minutes, believing for a few minutes, I'm going to be speaking on tongues and batting prophecy. Tongues and batting prophecy. Father, thank you. Because the entrance of the word give light, give understanding unto the simple. As simple folks, we've come to learn at your feet this morning. Father, I make my tongue depend on very writer. I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let us walk according to your mandate for our lives. Sir. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Have your seat in God's presence. I'm so glad you came to church this morning eh? because God has a word for you. You know, as I was preparing, I told my wife, I said, this is one of the most complicated and simple messages I've ever preached. I said, I'm trusting God that I'll be able to deliver the mind of God as I ought to. So if you have come to church today, I've got a message of hope. I've got a message of impact. I've got a message of God's faithfulness for you. Listen to this, no matter where you are in your sojourn, in your journey, I've come to tell somebody that God is in your story, and God is in your experience, and God is in your case. And I want to quickly, for a few minutes, be able to explain to you how the mandates of God for your life is going to pan out, and how you can agree with God spiritually to ensure that there is a manifestation of that which God has promised. Listen to this, one of the things that confuse many believers and make them walk out of faith or make them walk out of faith or doubt the possibilities of God is when they begin to rationalize. When they begin to rationalize how God will do what God has said concerning them. All right, so God, God has said he's going to make you a business owner. God has called you and he said he's going to give you your own ministry. God has called you into the ministry of intercession. Or God has called you and said you are going to be a real estate mogul. You are going to have your own consulting firm or your own engineering firm. And then you begin to say, ow. You see, when we begin to rationalize the ow, then we get into fear, anxiety, and perplexity. You begin to doubt whether the truth of what God has said will ever come to pass. You, you begin to doubt whether what God has said uh, will ever come true for you. You begin to doubt whether God is true even concerning even his promises. Listen to this. If you are going to walk with God, then living the life in the spirit uh, is something you and I must live. Living the life in the spirit is something you and I must understand uh, and then we must live. Uh, it's an absolute thing. Uh, the life that God has ordained and prepared for you can only be attained by the instrumentality of faith and by following the Spirit of God into the place that God has called you to. Consider the promises of God for your life. (laughs) This is, you know, I said a very practical message. I've always preached practical messages, something you can run with and chew, all right? So consider the promise of God for your life. As our faces differ, so also the promise is very different. Amen. Somebody here is praying for a relocation visa. Glory to God. If, If they are giving it, I will work out. Are you following me? It's not even prophecy. I'm not saying if they are prophesying, if you have given it, I'll work out. I won't take it. You get it. So it means that it is not in my own book. It is not what I'm praying for. It is not part of the promises of God for my life. Are you following what I'm saying? But there's somebody here that that may be one of the promises of God for your life. Uh, There are also people here that the promise of God for their life may be to get married. Uh, This ring means I'm married. This beautiful lady here shows that I'm very married. Glory to God. So it it means that it is no longer a promise that has become an attainment. Are you following what I'm saying? So as our faces differ, so also are the promises of God for our life uh, also very different. Look at the promises God has given you. And by that, I don't mean the promise 2022. I mean, look at the ones probably you haven't forgotten. The ones you have just put in that cupboard. I mean, maybe one day or somehow it's going to happen. Look at five years away, five years ago, ten years ago, God gave you a promise concerning your life. I want you to consider those promises. I want you to look at those promises of God.
You want me to say something? I'm sup- you're supposed to be looking at the promises. <laughs> it's intentional to be quiet. As soon as you can bring it up your heart. Uh, look at where you are staying. It does not look like the promise when you came to Lagos. Glory to God. I look at where you are walking. It doesn't look like the promise when you came to Lagos. Look at the promises. Listen, to this. God's promises concerning your life are the prophecies of God concerning your life. You know why? Because God's pro- God prophecy is the prediction of the future. And so when God gives you a promise, he's telling you about the future. It's not something you are staying in. That's why it's called a promise. It's futuristic. That's the language of a promise. So it is the prophecy over your life. The promises of God are the prophecies over your life. Somebody say, I don't have prophecies because you feel that somebody has not come to you and say, Heli, Eli, 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 Lama, Sabakhtani. I hear God say to you, no, you, you didn't have to hear that. In as much as God has spoken to your spirit and given you a vision, then you have a prophecy you are living for. It's a vision for your life. It's the promise of God for your life. It gives insight into your future. I'm here to tell someone that God is in the impossibilities. You know, I mean, you started out well. You started out with a vision in your heart. But look at the perplexity right now. Look at where you are right now. I'm here to tell somebody that God is in the impossibilities. <laughs> God is in the confusion. God is in the epic. God is in the incredulity. When you're asking yourself, how will this come true? You, you look, it seems like you're in a maze. <laughs> and it seems like there's no way out. I'm here to tell somebody that God is in that situation. It may not look like it, but God is here. And I want you to consider what I call what are the chances. Help me ask your neighbor, what are the chances? Don't go to the next slide. If you go to the next slide after this one, you'll come and preach. (laughs) What are the chances? All right? So what are the chances? What is the logical, statistical probability that all of these things are going to take place in your life. Now look at it. Though you work at uh, Marina, you live at um, down, down, San Gotedo, Um, you want to come to the front like they say in Lagos. Uh, Meaning that to come to the front means to at least let me enter Osaka from, and then I move to, (laughs) I get get to left phase one, then I move forward. Eko, and then get to, when you get to Koyi, you have got to the borderline. You understand? So you, you have that process. But where you are, and look at how much you are earning, what are the chances? <laughs> Love the fact that people, real force came to church. Real force came to church. That's zero. <laughs> zero. What are the chances? I mean, we must come to realize that scriptures can come to our level. Do you understand? We can make it very practical. What are the chances that you are going to build that company? And God said you are going to build it on the highland. What are the chances that Ransom House is going to have his own facility and build what I showed you some months ago? (laughs) Eden. (laughs) You remember Eden? What are the chances right now, statistically, Maybe minus two. <laughs> so, you've come to that place where you just live by the day. All right? Have you heard that word, waiting, go be, go be? Meaning that what will be, will be. So, you have gotten to that point of, we do our best. If our best is not enough, we cannot kill ourselves. It's a point where we all get to when we are at what I call our wit end. Where we get to that space and that point, where we get to that space and that point uh, where we cannot longer go forward or do anything for ourselves or by ourselves. I want to say to you, there are certain things you and I must learn to do at this point. But before then, I want to give you a frame for this sermon. I want to give you a frame. All right? I want to give you a frame. Because there is a greater one who lives in impossibility. And so there's somebody by the name of Messiah. And so I want to build a frame concerning the prophecies or the prediction of the future concerning his life. And then I'll tell you what prophecies are. And then we can go home. Do you understand that? Does that sound like a deal to you? All right, so later on. So the frame is simple. I want to give you a frame, and the frame is the Messiah. Um, so I, if, I, if I had so much finance and funds, I would have gone and do a carpentry work, understand that, and, and just do a lot of frame here, and then I'll have a lot of puzzle, and then I'll be fitting the frame for you, 
all right, so that you get a picture of what I'm saying. But I want to fit a frame today, and it's about the Messiah. Now, there are five predictions, more than five predictions, but I want to consider five predictions about the Messiah today. And I want to see the possibilities of what are the chances that this is going to happen. And then by looking at that frame, maybe you can also begin to look at your life. And maybe you find certain hope in these frames. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right, so number one, the first thing that was said concerning him is that he will be born by a virgin. Now, if somebody comes to you now and says she's pregnant, and then you ask her who is, doctor is here, and you say, who, who, who impregnated you? I say, nobody. I just had a sleep, and I had an encounter, and I'm pregnant. Now, you guys will laugh. You probably say she, you first of all ask her, was she in a party? Maybe she was drunk and then somebody raped her or something. You will never believe that it is possible for this to happen. But that was the frame the Messiah was supposed to fit. So if your chances are zero, I'm telling you that Jesus' chance was also zero. Because it's never been done. The law of nature says that something must, a seed must be planted before the womb will come, before the child will come forth. But here was what the scripture says. And, and very quickly, I will use some scriptures for us today. Matthew chapter 1. And then I read from verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother was betrothed to Joseph. Now, betrothed does not mean they were sleeping together. Betrothed just means that that is supposed to be the wife and the husband. Uh, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She was found with wife of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and all wanted to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, <laughs> for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Brother Helen, Brother Helen, a sister came, and you said, I'm not doing. And then you now said, no, you now have a vision. When you tell your mom that vision, your mom is going to say, wait, let's go to Orioki. You know, she has never mentioned mountain, but this, your situation will demand a mountain. Why? Because it's such an impossible thing. Impossible to believe, impossible to live in. But that was what they were telling Joseph to do. <laughs> and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So the very first condition Jesus had to fulfill, what was that condition? It was the condition that Jesus must be born by a virgin. No, I married my wife as a virgin, so that was not so much craziness. But the fact that you will not do anything and then she will be born. I've never believed that. But that's exactly what happened concerning Messiah. So the chances are zero, right? Okay, so let's progress. Uh, I'm looking at, look at your vision. I, you see, I thought it's not bad. It's not, you can see that vision is not that terrible. Can, can you see it's not that terrible? Now let me give you a second frame. Second frame, he was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Now, that is something major. The Messiah must also ensure the fulfillment uh, of this prophecy. What is that prophecy? Matthew chapter 2, 3 to 6. You know, when the wise men came to Herod, Herod had to call the, had to call the teachers of the law and say, and ask the question. When Herod had, he was troubled and, Jerusalem, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of people together, he inquired of them where the... Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judea are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will be shepherded by my people Israel. Now I believe you are following me. Now it is important that he be born by a virgin, but if the virgin had given birth to him in Philippi, it's not the Messiah. If the virgin had given birth to him, in Cairo, then he's not the Messiah. If the virgin had given birth to him in Lekki, Nigeria, <laughs> then he's not the Messiah. So there is also a frame he must fit. And I'm just letting you see how complicated this life story is supposed to be. So the, I, I, mean, I don't know whether your life is simple, but mine is quite complicated. Do you understand? Um, so I, I don't understand how God does it sometimes. So, but when I look at the vision, some people's vision is just simple. But I know folks who God has called to be a revivalist, and he's also tell them to go to real estate. And he's tell them, so you're asking, how can I fit all this frame together? Just follow me very closely here. Yeah. 
Now, it wasn't just important that he conquered the impossibility of being born by a miraculous conception. The delivery must be in Bethlehem of Judea. The Jewish people knew this, the Pharisees knew this, and, every, and the scribe, they knew this. Why? Because there was a prophecy said concerning him. There was a promise given before. So it is not important you, that um, you, you give birth, a virgin gave birth. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Where was he born? Do you know that if he was born even in Israel, but it was not Judea, Bethlehem in Judea, he's not the Savior? Third frame. Third frame. Now, this is, uh, the Bible says, the third one is that he must be called out of Egypt. Now, how do you call? <laughs> now, here is another impossibility. He will be called out of Egypt. Understand that Egypt represented a place of slavery for Israel. Now, you may not know this, but Egypt became a byword in Israel. Immediately after they were conquered and the Babylonians took them away, the Bible says Jeremiah, the prophet, actually stayed and prophesied that they should stay in Jerusalem, but they ensured that Jeremiah and the remnant moved to Egypt. And the prophecy came that they are going to be destroyed and they will not come back because it was a byword to go to Egypt. So God did not want his people back in Egypt because he had redeemed them again. Now, the same God is now saying he will call out the Messiah from the land that he has said people should not go again. Your life story is not that bad. You can hit one million followers on Instagram. It's not that bad. If that is what he's calling you to. <laughs> I know you have like 500 now and you're wondering, <laughs> but it's not that bad. Can you see? So, it became a byword. Yet God's prophet said the Messiah must be called out of Egypt. It's not enough for him to be a virgin birth. It's not enough for him to be born in Judea. He must be called out of Egypt. Now follow me. Matthew 2, 14 to 40, 15. When he arose... He took the child, the young child, that's Joseph, and his mother by night, and departed for Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I will call out my son. How amazing our God is. He will even use the hatred and the wickedness of men to fulfill his own plan and promises. You know that if Herod was not following the life of Jesus, there would not be a running into Egypt. And without him going to Egypt, he will not be called the Messiah. So the advancement of wickedness and evil against him actually fulfilled the plan of God for his life. Surely they shall gather, says the world. He says, surely they shall gather, but not of him. He says, every gathering shall fall for your sake. <laughs> Herod thought he was protecting his throne by his evil deeds. No, he was fulfilling prophecy. And in that act, he fulfilled Two prophecies. You will find the second one in Matthew chapter two, verse twenty-three. Don't forget Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-eight. The Bible says to us uh, in Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-eight: "For we know that all things work together for good." You see the way they are doing you in your place of work. All this gang up is working together. Without that ganging up, you will not enter Egypt, and without you entering Egypt, you will not be called out of Egypt. Sir. You see what I'm saying? So, the ganking up is working for your good. All the enemies are not actually winning. You see, when you are looking at a victory, the devil has had the victory. You think, oh, but God is not interested in the victory. He's interested in the war. Because in my win and one, uh, you know Anthony Joshua and <laughs> Anusik fought. Uh, Joshua won some runs. <laughs> but at the end of the day, he lost the battle. Do you understand? So, it is not who wins the land. It is who wins the battle. God's idea is to ensure that you always win. Now, follow me very closely. Relax every... Can I say this to somebody? Every opposition is working God's plan. You see, when you have that confidence, nothing moves you anymore. Can I give you number four? Now, look at how the impossibilities are. Conceived by a virgin in Judea, called out of Egypt. The third one is that it will be called... A Nazarene. <laughs> I thought that when you are born in a place in Israel, they call you by the name of that place. But now, God is saying that they would also call him a Nazarene. Now, it's enough that he'll be born in Bethlehem. He will be called out of Egypt. Now, he'll become the Nazarene. Now, listen to this Matthew 2 22 23. But when he heard, that's Joseph, he was returning from Egypt. But when he heard that Achilles was reigning over Judea instead of his father Aaron, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. 
Can you see that? So he had, and then he turned around. But he didn't turn around by himself. He didn't understand that there is a prophecy to fulfill. Listen, there will be some turnings in your life that you won't understand. But it is for the vision of God for your life to be fulfilled. Somebody will break relationship with you, and you will think the end of the world has come. But if you had married that person, now I'm looking at my life, and I can see. If I had married that person, <laughs> I, I know that it will not have panned out like this. You understand what I'm saying? But at that point, there's nothing you could have told me. I won't get me. There's nothing. You, I, I believe that the breakfast I was served was fresh. It was straight from the oven. Now, I get, get bread. It's a serious one. You know the way it smells? It smells better than it tastes. Glory to God. <laughs> May you not be served breakfast. Amen. <laughs> if you have been there, you have been there. You will see food and you will be full. <laughs> are you angry? You say no. Are you sad? No. Are you happy? No. You are just flexing. You know when you are there. A float, you're just there. You know, I, I'm an high priest that has been touched with the feelings of your infirmities. <laughs> All right, so, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that he might be called, which was, that he may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. So the turning around and the dwelling in the city was to fulfill another vision. Now, this is adding another layer of complication. So imagine you had wanted to fulfill all the prophecy by yourself without the hand of God. How will all of those things come to pass? I don't know whether God's vision and prophecy over your life are layers of complexities. Don't worry. It only means one thing. It takes only God to fulfill what God had promised. It was absolutely impossible for Jesus to seek to fulfill all of this prophecy by himself. Because at that time he was a child. Do you know that? They were carrying him around. He, was, he couldn't even make decisions by himself. So he did all of these. That's because God was at work. And finally, his ministry must begin in Sebulon and Naphtali. <laughs> now, this is very... Bible says in Matthew 3, 12 to 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Now, when they say this place is where it's supposed to be, I thought that Messiah should be in the capital. It should be in Jerusalem, not, you know, you should be in Lagos as a Messiah, not in Elorne. Are you following what I'm saying? Or Kebi? You understand what I'm saying? So, it, and living as he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Sebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Sebulon and the land of Taphtali, but the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen, there was a blueprint, a prophetic blueprint for his life. And I've given you those five frames now. They were the prophetic blueprint for, your, for his life. And you also have a blueprint for your life. Ah, God had left nothing to chance concerning Jesus. Can I say to somebody that God has left nothing to chance concerning you? These were not things that can be achieved or attained by human logic. That's why I started by asking you, what are the chances? All right? Psalms 40 verse 7. I said God has not left anything to chance. Psalm 40 verse 7, Psalm, 10, Psalm um, 47, Hebrews 10 verse 7. It was written concerning Jesus. He said, Lo, I have come as is written of me in the volume of the book to do your will, O God. So there were details written concerning him. He just came to fulfill what was written. Somebody said, I wish there is also a volume. At least I will know where I'm page one, chapter one, <laughs> chapter two, and chapter three. Listen, God has, a, God has planned every detail of your life, including the outbreaks. There is a prophecy over your life, including your struggles. The detractors are working out God's plan for your life. Listen, Psalm 139, verse 16. The psalmist said, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. All the days, your eyes saw my unformed body. I think the scripture is actually there. You can go move the slide. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isaiah 49 verse 1. Listen to me, you highlands. Hear this... You see that that sounds like island. 
Listen to me, you island. So you can say, listen to me, you Lagos island. Because, yes, that's it. Hear this, you distant nation. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Some of us believe that our names were what they just thought of. God has spoken it while you are in the womb. I'm trying to show you that your life was so planned that nothing was left to chance or nothing was an error or nothing was by mistake. Listen to Galatians chapter 1 and then verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased, Paul was saying, listen, there was somebody who set me apart. His name was God. When he was ready, he called me forth. There is a plan for my life. Can I say to somebody today, I don't know what the world has pummeled you with, but there is yet a plan for your life. And every of those books, you know, God does not have erasers. So everything he wrote, you are just acting it out. You see, we are at the end of a film that has been finished. Imagine, I, I, I don't know whether you watch football. Any football fan here? Any football fan here? Okay, so <laughs> um, um, Chelsea played yesterday, right? And they won 2 1. Is that not so? Okay. So if you get home now and they are showing that match again, and then you had already seen 1 1, Brighton has scored 1 already. Uh, when you now watch it and you see them pressing Chelsea, will you be agitated? You will not, because you know that the match has ended, and you know that they didn't score more than one. Are you following me? So even if they, ah, you see, even when they score, they, you see, oh, you must be offside. We are to kick out. You, why? Because you already know you've been to the end. Listen, we have seen the end. And in the end of the chapter is that victory belongs to Jesus. Sir. At the end of the chapter is that no vision goes without being fulfilled. At the end of the chapter is that we understand that every prophecy concerning our lives uh, are fulfilled and they are established. Uh, we have seen the end of the chapter, so we are just acting this out. So imagine you get pummeled and there's no money in your accounts. You smile because you know this is just the part of that chapter. Because at the end of the chapter is that you're a millionaire. Are you following what I'm saying? You, you've seen the end of the chapter, but you are going through the process. Uh, is somebody following me? You are fitting the frames. Uh, you might be in chapter 7. Subsection 2, paragraph 7. <laughs> in that paragraph, it may mean that there is a heartbreak. <laughs> in that chapter, it may mean that there is no food at home. In that chapter, it may mean that you are even in confusion. God has planned everything. <laughs> so, you, you understand that at the end, you call the pastor to come and open your hospital. How is going to happen, you don't know. So prophecy gives you the end. It never tells you the process. That is the problem with prophecy. Because people believe that when they have given you prophecy, your life should be smooth <laughs> and easy. So what is prophecy? The simple gift of prophecy is what I read Isaiah chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 3. The Bible says... Uh, the prophecy is for exhortation, edification, and comfort. Three things. And that is what it means even in Christianity in today. Now, Ezra chapter 6 verse 14. Prophecy actually helps the work of God. It helps you in your work with God. And helps you to move to the frontiers of God's work even forward. And so, prophecy is important. The Bible says in Ezra 6 14, So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Agai the prophet. Now, what is the prophesying of Agai the prophet? What was he doing? He was encouraging them. That prophecy, what, when he released those words, he was telling them, don't worry, you will win at the end. So, it, he was exalting them. When they were sad and they were weary, the word of the Lord will come to his prophet and it will give them comfort. And that's why we should come to church. Because the household of faith is where you get comfort, exhortation, and edification. You remember last week I told you about edification? I said edification is like charging a battery. Uh, that's what that Greek word actually means. It means to charge up until the battery is full. You know when your phone says low battery, low battery, low battery. Some phones that are first of all switch off before your phone switch off. It's telling you you can't function well anymore. When your spirit is low, you can't function well anymore. You need to charge it up. Build up yourself on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. 
Having established the fact, what are the things to note about prophecy? I want to quickly equip you. Because you see, that word prophecy, and don't forget I said that batting, what's the title of my sermon? Tongues and batting prophecies. All right? So I'm still going to get to tongues. Glory to God. All right? That's just conclusion. All right? So what, is, what are the things you must know about prophecy? Number one, prophecies are given to instruct a person or a group so that you can know what to do. They are given... The prophecies concerning Jesus told him he was going to end up on the cross. No amount of prayer and confession will stop that. That was what the Messiah must fulfill. Israel was always led by prophet and prophecy. Even we were instructed by prophecies concerning Jesus. And that's what I shared with you. Five prophecies concerning the the Messiah. And then number two, we must learn to test all prophecies. You see, we have become a, a people who do not test prophecies. Can I say that to you? We have become a people who don't test prophecies. So because somebody somewhere is saying something, does not mean it's true concerning you. Because a prophet has a big name, or has huge followership, maybe on social media, or even in his church, does not mean he's saying the mind of God. Any word that does not agree with your spirit, Discard it. First John chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says the Spirit speaks expressly. Expressly. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not what it says. No, that's not what it says. First John chapter 4, verse 1. No. Don't take all the scriptures I quote for you. I can be wrong. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Aha. The Bible says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, many false prophets. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's what I was quoting about 1 Timothy. It's not 1 it's John. All right? Say, test every prophecy. You must learn to test every prophecy. Now, can I say to you that if you are a builder of believers and charge of believer, every word you hear will not shock you. Every prophecy you hear will not shock you. It will agree with you. Somebody said, leave where you are and move to this city. There would have been a working of God in your heart concerning that. So when the prophecy comes, uh, it aligns with what he's saying. So it's like a confirmation. If it is not confirming anything, you have the right to set it apart for a while. You may not set it apart because maybe you are slow in hearing God. But I've always maintained and told people that God's method of operating is not that God speaks about us to other people. God's method is to first of all speak to us first. If you cannot hear, that's when God will speak to somebody else so that he can come and tell you because God has been telling you and you have refused to hear. So in Yoruba, they say God is not an olofofo. What is olofofo in English? God is not a gossip. God is not a gossiper. (laughs) <laughs> he wants to tell him the, the owner of <laughs> what is he owning <laughs> but God is not a gossip God is not a gossip his idea is to tell you first his main point is to tell you first no matter who a man is if he tells anything that he does not agree with your spirit let it go no matter how awesome men are they can be wrong listen because there are fake prophets does not mean there are not real prophets alright don't let me talk to the prophets. Don't let me talk about prophets. Let's just go on. Number three. The purpose of Christian prophecy is stated in 1 Corinthians 14.3. Now listen to this, and this will help you. You see, there are people who only prophesy about bad things. Are you, are you following me? The queen will die. Have, have you, are, you saw some videos. The queen will die. Uh, uh, the president of Nigeria will be sick. Uh, somebody. So, that, so when that thing happens, they will not go and cut the video. And begin to show it, and you wonder, ah! So they said, why is it that their God never reveals good things? Christian prophecy is about edification, not about building, destroying. It's about building up. God will always give his word. So I can't come and say, Morikulo Jue. No. If I say, I see dead on your face, uh, then I must be able to tell you there is a solution. So if God reveals that they want to get you, God must also reveal the solution and the way out so that you are not gotten. But that a prophecy comes uh, and it puts people in fear, in bondage, uh, without building up, that is not Christian prophecy. You could not go to a prophetic meeting and come back with fear, being afraid. You should come back having been comforted. 
That's the purpose of Christian prophecy. He must meet these three things. He must edify. He must build you up. He must exalt. To exalt is to console, is to help. You are about to give up. A message comes. As if somebody came here depressed. You don't know the way out. God says to tell you, don't give up. <laughs> you see, when that word comes, it put fire again in your bones. That's prophecy. Then number four, prophecy should exalt the spirit of Christ and align with the dictate of scriptures. Every prophecy, whether personal or generic, should align with the spirit of scriptures. That means that you cannot receive a prophecy to receive me as a husband. Amen. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? Why are you quiet? You can't receive me as a husband. I've seen people who come to me. I mean, somebody, somebody was chatting me up quite recently and said, God has said, I said, what is God saying? God cannot, which God? Which address is this your God? And then I went to meet her and I said, can't you see? That's where I wear the gold one. Can't you see? I'm very married. God cannot be speaking. Can't you hear? He said, he does not know, but she knows the God that speaks to her. Uh -uh. So, is that God saying that my wife will die or I will divorce? Well, what kind of God is that? That is a Yahoo God. That is not a Yahweh. That's not Yahweh. That's not Yahweh. That's Yahoo God. Because that is a fake God. You can't receive prophecy and say you receive my car. No, sir. You can receive the kind of car, but you can't receive my car. <laughs> So you, you have to understand the spirit of it. Somebody is in a relationship already and you are bowing down, bowing head. Say, Maluka, Vilulushi, Milukulu. Leave those things. Oh, till law, take in. It's gone. So the spirit of prophecy must align with the dictator of scriptures. You see, when some people say there is a deal now, when you invest your money, you get times 20, and, and you people are going there. I smile. Why? It's against the dictate of scriptures. Scriptures has already said it that that kind of thing will cause you sorrow. You can jack out with it though. <laughs> but the day that they will catch you in it, if 10 million goes, it goes near. Why? Because it's not, a, it's, it's not, it's not valid in scriptures. It's not valid in scriptures. We must understand that every prophecy you receive must be according to scriptures. So can I talk to you about your personal revelations and prophecies? So you have a dream. And then in that dream, you saw yourself in the river. And then you say, ah, mommy, what a spirit, oh, glory, hallelujah. Now, that may mean that, that thing has, was operating in your father's line. It doesn't have to get to you. You know why? Because the Bible says you are a new creature. All things are past, all things are new. Let me say this to you. Deliverance for the believer is standing and appropriating what Jesus has done at Calvary. Because somebody, you could not do it yourself, somebody came into that place and did it for you. You could have stood in that ground and said, I am a new creature. I am a new creature. No evil stands against me. Because it is contrary to scriptures. What did Jesus die for? Are you following what I'm saying? Say, um, oh, they marry late in our family. Come on, stop that nonsense. Is, is, that against, is, is that in scriptures? That's a prophecy that runs in your life, but you have come, the prophecy has stopped. How will it stop? Not by you saying, I'm born again. No. You have to address it. You have to stand your gap, in the gap, and you have to say, the end has come. Prophecy in scriptures is the testimony of Christ. Revelation 19 verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, are there prophecies in your life? Are there things God has spoken to you and concerning you? Now, let me tie this up. This is where I'm going. I said all of that to say this. <laughs> are there things God has spoken to you concerning you? How will those things come to pass? Listen, by the instrumentality of prayers. But praying with the human mind is too small, too limiting, too, but the complex and awesome will of God for your life. You will need to do more. You will need a secret formula of God. I pray thee, how can someone pray for all of the things to be battered in the life of Jesus? How can you pray that you be hated by Herod? How can you pray to go to Egypt? 
How can you pray? You see, your, your prayers are too limited uh, to bad the interwoven complex intricacies that your life needs. Your life needs an alignment of many things. For the prophecy over your life, I told you that prophecy is the prediction of your future. So the promises of God for your life are prophecies for your life. Listen, for those prophecies to come to pass, there would be the need for these six things, man of God. Now look at them. An alignment. Number one, an alignment of systems. There are systems that must align if those things are going to come to pass. You know, the system, the education system now, you know that this strike is working for good for some people. There are private schools that didn't have students before. I hope you know. <laughs> now, they are about the cheapest. Some people never go there. <laughs> people are saying, ah, maybe you should go there, 400K, 500K. Now they have so many students who have withdrawn from the federal to that place, even though the person started that school and he didn't have any students, now there, is a, there are a lot of students. Why? Because the systems have come to work for him. You see what I mean by systems? There would also be conditions and situations. We saw that in the life of Jesus. Look at all the conditions and situations that had to work, come together. Because of you, some people will have some lack. God created scarcity in the economy of Egypt because of Joseph's dream. The condition was right. When he interpreted the dream, the, pres the, president, the, uh, the president, Pharaoh said, who can we find that can fit this more than you? Ophni Phineas, that's the name they gave him. Look at that. Policies must come to place. Why? There are policies that will shift. You understand that the king Herod actually brought out a policy and said that every child should be killed who was born between a period. That was a policy. That policy actually worked so that they could carry the Messiah to Egypt. So that the prophecy that says out of Egypt, I have called out my son, can be fulfilled. Prophecies will come. Policies will come. That's why you should not be angry with every policy the government does. Whether you like the government or not, even the wicked is working for the good of God. Policies will come. Now, you would also need what we call supernatural alignment. How do you align it with what God is doing for in my time? How do I align with what God is doing in my time? You cannot align except you first of all have what we call spiritual intelligence. To have an understanding, this is what to do. Let me say this to you. One person that works in so much spiritual intelligence in scriptures, more than we give him value for is the man by the name of Joseph, the father of Jesus. He had so much spiritual intelligence, without him, Jesus would have been killed. Without him, even Jesus would not have a mother, would not have a father. Because he would have put him in shame. He would not even have an angelic visitation. He would not take the mother in. Say, why? Me, bastard. Lie, lie, it cannot happen. But he was an honorable man. Apart from that, he had instructions again and again. In dreams, a jelly visitation to know what to do part time. Let me say this to you. For the vision of your life to come true, you will need spiritual intelligence. I know you read a lot of books. But the wit of man and human wisdom will come to an end. That is when the wisdom of God will now come up. Therefore, you will have to do many things more than others are doing. I tell people, what is your, what is your advantage? The same book that's on the shelf, others are reading. There's an advantage in God. And then see that? The set time. Nothing can be done except when the time comes. Was it not a class that says it makes all things beautiful in its own time? That means there is a time for certain things to come to pass. Therefore, you must be patient. You must be building. You must be ready so that when the time comes, you just walk into it. Do you see that? The time come for the Messiah. The time came for him to launch out in ministry. He knew. He knew that the time had come. The set time had come. You must know the set time for you to step into what God is calling you into. It may not look like it, but you must know. Listen to this. My question is, how can you cover all of these six things in the place of prayer? Can you see that God just put us in this world with so much complexities? Go back to the slide. Can you see that God just put us in so much complexities? Imagine they say you should come and pray. And pray for your future. How can you cover this? So you see the way you have been praying. 
Lord, do it. Lord, do it. The things that are involved in the batting of that vision is too much. So how will you pray? What will be your prayer point? Lord, I call for, I call for, I call for my engineering company. I call it for, I call it for, I call it for. Your company will not blossom except there is first a need for that company. So God will first of all have to create that need. So you're asking yourself, how do I cover these things? To be a man is a difficult place to be. A man living in vision, promises, and prophecy understand that this is hard. This cannot be done by human mind. The only thing to do is to seek the help of the giver of the gifts, of the giver of the vision, is to seek the help of the Holy Spirit. To begin to cry out in the language of heaven, you understand, you have an understanding that your vocabulary is too limited. Your expressions are too vague. You cannot communicate what you want in your mind. Why? Not because you can't speak well. You understand that? It's not because you have grammar limitation. It's because you have limited knowledge. You don't even know tomorrow. I can't continue like this. I have a vision to live for. I have a prophecy over my life. I have a promise to live for. The conditions are great, but God is greater. I'm just going to switch to tongues. I'm just going to pray in the spirit, sir. I told you one thing you do last week is to cover ground in the future. Let me say this to you. The way to bat that promise is to pray in the spirit. Sir. The way to bat that promise is to say, Lord, I'm just going to pray for this promise and I'm going to pray in tongues and start speaking in tongues. Sir. Why? Because you do not even know what you need for that situation. You don't know what needs to be controlled. God, we need to change government sir, so that that vision can come true. It's some, some, some visions are that high. I up. God will have to change some people in power. You need to say, Lord, Lord, this vision come true. Listen, I'll, I'll give you an image in front of you. Paul understood this. The Bible says God called, Jesus called Paul by the name of Saul on his way to Damascus. You remember that story? He was on his way to Damascus and the light shone on his path. And Jesus said, a man should go and pray for him. By the name of Ananias. You remember the story? And the man went and told him. The man said, I won't go. And Jesus told Ananias, he said, I have called him to take my message to the Gentiles. You understand that? Now, for many months afterwards, Paul was in Arabia in the desert. Nothing was happening. Jesus, he saw Jesus. So, uh, you, you, you didn't want to say Jesus. But, I mean, this man saw Jesus. And yet he was in Arabia and nothing was going on. He was wasting away. What are the chances that you will take the war to the Gentiles when you are now in the desert in Arabia? What are the chances? But you know what? I found out the secret from the writing of Paul himself. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. He said, for I do not know what I... He said in the same way the Spirit comes to help us and help us in our weakness. We do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it as we should. I believe it was in this, in, when he was in Arabia that he discovered that he doesn't even know how to pray. Then he started saying, he said, oh, but the Spirit himself knows our need and at the right time intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for words. Kamba shiala do siadaba. He said, he knows the right time. So do you, can you even see that there is a right time to pray? <laughs> Apart from you knowing how to pray, having that weakness, he said he knows the time to pray. And he who searches the earth knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes before God on behalf of God's people in accordance with God's will. God's promises are God's will for your life. So the Holy Spirit is going to be interceding in accordance with God's promises and God's will for your life. That's why you need to pray in the Spirit. That's why you need to pray in tongues. That's the only way that album can become a reality. That's the only way that engineering company can become a reality. That's the way that tech company can be battered. That's the only way that business can be battered. That's the way management can be battered. You've got to say, Lord, I know I'm too limited. I don't even know what I need to do. Let me say what happened to you concerning Paul. Bible says, as Paul stood there, I believe Paul was praying in the spirit. Something happened in Antioch. There was a, revel there was a revolution of God's word. And then the Bible says, a man by the name of Barnabas, he left where he was. 
And then he went. Can you see a shift? He left and he went to Arabia and picked Saul. Are you following me? And took him by the hand and took him to Antioch. It was when they were in Antioch teaching the word of God that the Bible says in Acts chapter 13 and then verse 2. And the Bible says when they ministered to, the, to God, the Holy Spirit says, separate unto me Barnabas and Paul for the work which I have called them to. Can you, can you see conditions that have to fit together? Somebody somewhere will call you. I say, what are you doing in that company? What are you doing? Can, we, can you join us to start this company? <laughs> I mean, it was not Saul's idea. It wasn't Saul's idea to go to Antioch. But Barnabas, and that was when they were there, that the door to the Gentiles opened to him. Can you see? That that vision may not even, be, it may not even come in Lagos. <laughs> That vision may come in another city. Our God is a good God. Listen, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, Paul writing to Christians at Ephesus. Now, he had been a Christian for a while. Listen to what he says. He said, with all prayer and petition, pray with specific request at all times on every occasion and in every season in the Spirit. He said, and with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and, pet and petition, interceding in prayer for all of God's behalf people. You remember Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, he said, then what am I to do? He said, I will pray with the Spirit uh, by the Holy Spirit within me, and I will pray with the mind, using what I understand, uh, and I will sing with the Spirit by the Holy Spirit that is within me, and I will sing with the Spirit uh, using words that I understand. Uh, and then he went further, having understood this divine secret, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, uh, he said, I thank my God uh, that I speak in tongues more than you all. I told you last week there's no humility in Paul. <laughs> he looked at them, a whole city, a whole church, uh, told them I speak in tongues more than you all. Uh, I said to myself, how did he learn it? He learned it at Arabia. He learned it at his place when he was still unknown. Uh, he, learned, he learned it uh, two years uh, when nobody was with him. In the hours of preparation, uh, he was praying in the spirit. Uh, there is no greater place to prepare for your vision and for the future. There is no greater way to bad prophecy than to pray in the spirit. Uh, now that you are not known, now that nobody sees you, now that nobody recognizes the gift that is upon your life, uh, now that it seems you are insignificant, uh, now that it seems you dwell in the land of mediocrity, it is time to pray in the spirit uh, because when you do that, you are laying layers. You are building foundation. You are constructing road that your future will ply on. Can somebody say it is time to connect? Connect my today with my future. Connect my today with God's promises. Connect my today with the promises of God concerning my life. I'll no longer stand and dwell in little. I know there is greater power, greater possibilities when a man prays in the spirit. There's greater possibilities when a man channels his energy even to the things of the spirit. When when you allow the Holy Ghost help inside of you within you to pray even along with you. That's the gift that God has given unto man. You can pray in the spirit. You can intercede concerning that vision. Your intellect, your knowledge is too small. It's too minute. It's too limited to pray and batter even God's prophecy for your life. But as you begin to pray in the spirit, now all the structures will begin to come together. All the plans will begin to come together. All the things uh, will begin to join together. Everything will become uh, even what God uh, wants it to be. Is there somebody in this house who say, Lord, uh, I'm going to give myself to prayer. I'm going to pray. Can you just pray where you are? Can you pray five minutes in the spirit? Uh, can you cover ground? Uh, can you connect your future to your today? Mandoli. Uh, 